Hello everyone, welcome to webinar series on introduction and access to global air quality forecasting data and tools. This is a three part webinar series. Today is the first session where we will discuss the basics of air quality forecasting. In the second and third session, we'll go over NASA's GEOS model and ECMW SCAMS model global air quality forecast respectively. I'm Pawan Gupta, senior scientist of USRA at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. We'll be presenting the today's session. My colleague, Dr. Melanie Fallit Cook, contributed to this presentation as well. We also have Brock, Selwyn, and Jonathan behind the scene to support this webinar series in many different ways. We have following learning objective for today's session. Uh, by the end of this training session, uh, we expect attendees will understand science behind their quality forecasting and how it parallel drones to the weather forecasting. Various methods to forecast air quality. Some of the model components such as emissions, initializations and use of the satellite data and regional air quality models for online and offline use will be uh, discussed as well. Air pollution is contamination of the atmosphere by gaseous, liquid, solid or mixture. By breathing these pollutants, uh, they have serious effects on human health and entire biosphere. They reduce the visibility damage the materials and affects the weather and climate of the planet. The major pollutants monitored by the environmental agencies includes ozone, particulate matters in different size range, lead, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide and toxic compounds. This slide shows three key components of air quality monitoring and forecasting. Traditionally, air quality monitoring has been done using instruments on the ground. These monitors are usually very accurate, but the map near the top shows the location of ground monitors of PM2.5 around the globe and you can see the large gaps in coverage. Even in countries with a lot of monitors, there are gaps. Satellite data help fill in these gaps in coverage and provide information where there is no information from the ground. Atmospheric models are needed to predict future air quality. Together these three components can comprehensively observe and predict air quality. In this webinar series, our focus will be modeling. So why air quality forecasting needed? Air quality forecast provides public the public with air quality information which they can make daily lifestyle decisions to protect their health. This information allows people to take precautionary measures to avoid or limit their exposure to unhealthy level of air quality. In addition, many communities use forecast for initiating air quality action or awareness days which seek voluntary participation from public to reduce the pollution and improve the local air quality. Now let's see what are the factors which controls the concentration of pollutants both in the atmosphere and at the surface. So number one is emissions. It can be both natural and anthropogenic. Second is the atmospheric processes and it includes physical and chemical processes to produce and remove pollution from the air. And the third is the meteorology or the weather condition which can affect both emissions, atmospheric processes as well as the concentration directly. Therefore, information and understanding of these three component is necessary to determine and forecast pollution concentration at surface. Now let's understand some more details about particle pollution uh, or particulate matter 
in next few slides. Particulate matter, unlike ozone, is not a specific chemical entity, but it is a mixture of particles of different sizes, shapes, composition, and chemical, physical, and thermodynamic properties. If the particles are directly emitted and stays in the chemical composition in the atmosphere, typically called primary particles, whereas the secondary particles are formed in the atmosphere through chemical reactions. Here are some examples of typical primary and secondary uh, particles which uh, present in the air as pollutants. In this slide, uh, we'll learn about some of the mechanism through particles forms in the atmosphere and their respective size distribution. So the chemical processes can either form new particles or add layers uh, on existing particles. Uh, this depends on the concentration of precursors which are required to create new particles, uh, incoming solar radiation, temperature, uh, amount of water vapor or relative humidity and other mediums in the atmosphere. Some of the particles which forms in chemical uh, through chemical process in the atmospheres uh, includes NOx, uh, nitrates, sulfates, um, and some of the organic compound. If you look the chart here, you will see there are three distinct peaks uh, of volume size distribution. The first one is corresponding to the nucleation mode, uh, which means they represent ultrafine particles typically produced through uh, nucleation from the gases. Uh, then the accumulation mode which is uh, submicron particles less than one micron uh, typically they uh, produced either through coagulation or condensation of vapor on existing particles. And the third one is the coarse mode uh, which are larger than one micron particles and this is typically generated through the mechanical processes uh, on the ground such as wind blown dust or uh, sea salt over ocean. Now if we want to look the particle distribution in the atmosphere uh, then they can be looked into three different ways by numbers, by their surface area or by the volume or by mass. So the size of PM ranges from about tens of nanometer, which is typically on the left side of this scales, uh, which are corresponds to the molecular aggregates and to the tens of micron, which corresponds to the mechanically generated particles. The smallest particles are generally uh, more numerous and the number distribution of particles generally peaks below 0.1 micron. The size range below 0.1 micron is also referred as ultrafine range. The largest particles uh, which are from 0.1 to 10 micron are smaller in number but contain most of the PM volume or mass. The peak of PM surface area distributions is always between the number and the volume peaks. PM in the size range of 0.1 to 2.5 micron has the longest residence time days to week because it's neither settle nor coagulate quickly. Particle in this size range are the most efficient and penetrating deep into the lung. In addition, the light scattering efficiency per PM mass is highest at about 0.5 nanometer. Therefore, PM 2.5 is very important to investigate for their impact on human health, visibility and climate. The chart on the right shows the their comparison, relative comparison with some of the common objects such as human hairs and sand uh, which relates to the size of PM 2 and PM 2.5.
Historically, PM 2.5 is measured using filter-based sampler and averaged for 24 hour or longer. US EPA has devised a federal reference method. In this method, PM2 or PM is collected on a 47 millimeter Teflon filter, which is later weighted for mass. Deployment of the continuous PM2.5 monitoring network began in 1999 here in the US using federal equivalent method is and is producing a more detailed understanding of PM 2.5 mass characteristics. Two continuous mass measurement instrument that is BAM beta attenuation method and TOM which is tapered element oscillating microbalance are typically used. Both can be operated with a either PM10 or PM2.5 inlet. Chemical composition is still largely measured by filter-based instrument. In recent time, low-cost sensor technologies are emerging. These low-cost sensors both present new opportunities and challenges with respect to the data quality and accuracies. So, okay, let's now move on to the weather conditions which can affect pollution concentration or the meteorological conditions which have significant impact on the air quality at the ground. Weather or meteorological pattern influence the air quality even under constant emission conditions. Therefore, weather related measurements can be critical in modeling of air quality. Here is an example how a ridge of high pressure can influence poor air quality through three different pathways. The shrinking motion will create surface high, creating calm winds or light winds leading to stagnation and poor air quality. It can also produce clear skies which can enhance the photochemistry and leading to poor air quality. And temperature inversion can reduce the vertical mixing, trapping pollution in lower atmospheric layer also leads to poor air quality. Similarly, trough of low pressure can lead to good air quality through multiple pathways. Rising motions create surface low moderate to strong winds which allow horizontal dispersion and that results into good air quality. Similarly, the cool moisture and uh, it destabilizes the atmosphere, it creates cloudy skies which can reduce the photochemistry but sometimes it can also enhance the PM2.5 chemistry inside the cloud and it can lead to good or bad air quality. Under the, under the rising motions, there is less chance of temperature inversion, which enhance the vertical mixing and that can lead to good air quality. So now let's look at the wind. Uh, wind can also affect the pollution concentration in different ways. Uh, emission from sources such as dust from dry soil and sea salt over oceans are highly dependent on wind speed and their transport by both speed and direction. Concentration of precursors are critical in generating the secondary particles. Strong winds can disperse them and make less favorable condition for chemical reaction. Similarly, strong winds quickly disperse particles and lower the concentration and calm winds can help accumulation and increasing pollution. Transport of pollution from source to different places depends on, on both wind speed and direction. Therefore, it is critical to know the wind condition in different layers of the atmosphere to account for the transport pollution in forecasting models. Temperature. Temperatures are associated with increased evaporation, biogenic and power plant emission 
which act to increase both PM2.5 and ozone. So many emissions can be enhanced or suppressed under different temperature conditions. Chemistry, low temperature inversion can reduce the vertical mixing, increasing the concentration of precursors and then that can lead to more production of secondary pollution. Temperature can also directly affect the concentration. So cold temperature typically produce the inversion, lower the mixing layer height, it leads to the accumulation of particles and then it leads to higher concentration of particles within the surface layer. High temperature on the other hand which is shown on the top figure can have a either inversion break or inversion is up in the high in the atmospheres. Uh, higher the mixing layer height and which disperse the particles into bigger portion, bigger volume of air and decrease the concentration at the surface layer. So temperature also play critical role in regulating air quality at the surface. And then there are other factors which uh, have critical role like rain, one of the removal processes for both PM 2.5 PMs and its precursor um, can also suppress certain emissions such as dust. Uh, cloudy condition can reduce formation of secondary particles due to reduced available of sunlight or photochemistry. But some chemical reaction inside or on the cloud particles can be enhanced in the presence of clouds. Moisture, so higher the soil moisture can suppress uh, emissions such as dust. Uh, the atmospheric moisture on the other hand or the water vapor can enhance the production of part secondary particles. So each of these meteorological or weather conditions have a very specific impact on uh, how the air quality will change at the surface. So now so far we learned about the particles, their formations, weather conditions which may directly or indirectly affect the concentration in atmosphere and near the surface. Now we'll learn about forecasting of these particle concentration using various methods. So the success of an air quality forecasting program depends not only on accurate prediction but also meeting the needs and objective of forecasting recipients who are going to use the forecast. The major purpose includes public health notification, episodic control programs such as action days and scheduling specialized air quality monitoring program. Each of these purpose have a specific forecasting needs which may vary in accuracy, spatial and temporal scales. So air quality forecasting can include air quality index or AQI and the concentration forecasting. AQI are nothing but range of pollutant concentration and divided into several categories such as good, moderate and so on. Each category has a associated health advisory such as to avoid prolonged exposure by the kids during orange day corresponding to an unhealthy for sensitive group air quality category. Air quality index can be defined for single pollutants or they can be multi-pollutant air quality index. As it is obvious that forecasting, AQI, forecasting of AQI is relatively a simpler problem because here you are dealing with the range of particle concentration than the predicting accurate, the con accurate mass concentration of particle itself. So air quality forecasting uh, can be done using uh, many many different ways. Here I will go over some of the traditional methods used within the community. Some of them are very simple to use and some of them require a lot more understanding and resources to implement. 
So let's get started on that. So the first method is persistent means tomorrow's concentration will be same as today's or yesterday's. Persistent forecasting works because atmospheric variables including PM 2.5, ozone exhibit a positive uh, statistical association with their own past or future values. In other words, large values of a variable tend to be succeeded by a large values. Similarly, a small values of variable tend to be succeeded by small values. So for example, if today's 24 hour PM 2.5 mass concentration was about 10 microgram per cubic meter, it is likely that tomorrow's 24 hour PM 2.5 concentration will also be relatively low unless some specific air quality happens or some kind of transport happens. So persistent forecast value can be modified based on the change in weather condition also. Um, so this particular method works well in areas with less pollution variability, uh, works in areas with persistent weather conditions for several days. Uh, definitely it has a high uncertainties. Um, another limitation of persistent method that it cannot predict the beginning and end of an air quality event. It can only give you a more longer term uh, average uh, conditions of air quality. It only required data from measurement, minimum software and expertise required to do this. But most importantly, it is very limited on a point locations and based on the ground measurement itself. The second method is uh, climatology. It uses an average or extreme condition on a given locations. Uh, air quality is highly depends on weather pattern as we saw earlier. And when they repeat, air quality patterns do repeats as well. This particular methodology required data from multiple years. Uh, data quality controls and change in emission should be known. Um, the climatological values uh, can act as a, a bound and guide to the air quality forecast. It cannot be often used as a standalone method, but it can serve as a supporting methods to, uh, to inform other forecasting methods. Uh, does not require a lot of expertise or software. Uh, some of the example for the climatological uh, values which can be used for air quality forecasting, um, like all time maximum for month and site, uh, you can also derive climate logics for how uh, how long certain AQI values will remain in a given month. Uh, on a given month or by week, you can also calculate number of days when AQI will be high. Um, we can also derive the climate logic by day of the week. So uh, weekend versus weekdays climate logical values can be used uh, to forecast uh, air quality. Uh, similarly, it can be done for holidays and non-holiday seasons, uh, traffic areas, which is urban versus uh, rural areas. So climate logic can be used in many different ways. So uh, for example, uh, air quality forecasting predict a value of AQI of 150, uh, but climate logic says that this never happened at that location. So forecast can be revised. Uh, based on the climate logic to more probable value of 130 or 120. Uh, so change in emission can result in the same weather condition producing the lower pollution concentration. So we, we have to be careful when we start using the climate logic as one of the method to forecast tomorrow's air quality or future air quality conditions. The next air quality forecasting method is called criteria. It's also called rule of thumb. It uses a threshold value of either pollutant concentration or one of the weather parameter uh, or both. This method is 
based on the fact that a specific value of certain weather parameter and air quality variables are associated with high pollutant concentration. For example, high pollutants concentration are often associated with hot temperature and those temperature can be used as one of the predictor for pollutant concentration. In this particular example, here shows a boundary layer often associated with PM2.5 concentration. Uh, it's a good method to forecast an exceedance, non-exceedance or pollution in a particular AQI category range rather than the exact concentration. Need uh, In order to do apply this method, uh, we need knowledge of physical and chemical processes that can influence the pollution concentration. Uh, it can be used as a primary forecasting method but also be with other method. Easy to use and relatively simpler to develop. It can also be revised easily as more data becomes available. Uh, in the figure, uh, one example is shown here is that on x-axis you have a maximum temperature, on y-axis you have a daily maximum 8 hours ozone concentration. And what this plot shows that if we put a thresholds on maximum surface temperature of 28 degree, uh, then it does shows that 8 hour ozone concentration only going to go above 80 ppv if the temperature is beyond 28 degree centigrade. So most of these points only occurs except few of them here when the temperature is higher. So this can be a criteria for high ozone day when the temperature is going beyond 28 degrees centigrade. So this is one of the example for criteria methods. The next method is classification and regression tree or CART method. Is a CART is a statistical procedure designed to classify data into distinct or dissimilar groups. For air quality forecasting, uh, CART enables a forecaster to develop a decision tree to predict pollutant concentration based on the value of predictor variable that are well correlated the, with the pollutant concentration. The splitting of data sets into groups and tree development continues until the data in each group are sufficiently uniform. So therefore it is a iterative process. Uh, predictor variable used in car typically includes meteorological data but may also include air quality data or other data such as the day or the week or the length of the day etc. Typically CART is used um, to create by a software and it required multiple years of the data. Uh, CART is very sensitive uh, for uncertainties in the input variables and can have larger impact on output of PM2.5. The next method is a regression equations uh, or which can also be extended using artificial intelligence, neural network or machine learning methods. Uh, it's an, a statistical method. It is based on the relationship between input, which can be typically meteorological parameters or other pollutants and the output, which is PM2.5 in this case. Here is an example of a typical regression equation where Y is the dependent variables, the the variable which we want to predict that is PM2.5 uh, and then X is a independent variable for which we have measurements available and then the Vita0 and Vita1 are regression coefficients uh, uh, intercept and the slope of the equation. So this is a very simple regression equation uh, a two variable regression equation which can be used. The regression equations can be a multivariable also where you have more than one independent data sets like x1, x2 and xn. 
Uh, these are often forecasted values of weathers, for example, temperature, winds, relative humidity. Um, in order to apply and design regression equation, the understanding of physical chemical process and association between independent and dependent variables is required. Typically, it is done using a statistical software package which can fit regression equations. Uh, you can use an Excel spreadsheet uh, as the simplest uh, software to build these models. Uh, often, uh, whenever you develop a regression equations, uh, an independent model verification required means you need to use the data sets independently which have not used to build your regression equation to verify the model and the accuracy associated with it. Uh, often, these kind of regression equations are uh, have a overfitting problem. Uh, they are more appropriate to predict the mean better than the extreme values. So uh, it always uh, regression equations always have trouble in predicting very high or low value of the distribution. Uh, most of, most often uh, regression equation will likely under predict the high concentration and over predict the low concentration in last five to ten years uh, machine learning and neural networks uh, algorithms uh, have become more popular and have kind of taken a place uh, uh, and uh, replaced the regression equation approach using these more sophisticated ways where uh, these algorithms can train or learn the patterns uh, between the input and output uh, and they can be uh, they can learn the pattern which is not linear and more non-linear and complex in nature now the, the the most important air quality methods are deterministic air quality modeling these are uh, mathematically represented the process that affects the air quality so these are more physical methods of air quality forecasting uh, it often involves a system model that works together to simulate the emissions transport diffusion transformation from one component to another and removal of air pollution from air Historically, uh, these physical models are used to simulate future scenarios of air pollution for change in emission scenario or change in climate conditions. These models can be simple 1D model or 3D models. 1D models mean only providing surface level concentration or 3D models means um, in addition to horizontal grid and time resolution, it can also have a vertical uh, resolution providing the concentration in different layer of the atmosphere. Uh, these methods required years of development and in-depth expertise on air quality processes and access to emission data sets with high-end computing resources. The meteorological models uh, forecast the meteorological condition that determine transport and mixing uh, influence the chemistry uh, emissions and deposition so here is some more on deterministic air quality modeling uh, prognostic meteorological models solve fundamental equations to simulate atmospheric behavior and as we discussed there are three different models which works together here the meteorological model these models forecast meteorological condition that determine transport and mixing and influence chemistry, emissions and deposition. And then there are emission models. These models simulate the temporal and spatial and chemical distribution of emission of pollutants in question and are precursors from both anthropogenic and natural sources. In the air quality models, these model uses the forecast from meteorological and emission models to simulate the transport, diffusion, transformation by chemical reaction 
and removal of air pollution. Three dimensional air quality models are classified being either Lagrangian or Eurelian, uh, depending on method used to simulate uh, time varying distribution of pollution concentration. Some of the example of uh, meteorological models uh, are MM5, RAMS, and WARF. Now let's look a little bit more on the emissions. Um, there are many sources of emissions on the ground, both natural and anthropogenic. These emission data sets should include the amount of emissions by each source and each chemical compound for each horizontal and temporal grids as defined by the model setup. Some examples of emission include dust, soot, um, nitrate and sulfate, uh, biogenic, sea salt, volcanic eruptions, etc. etc. So now the Lagrangian uh, or in other words trajectory models uh, typically follow the individual air partial over time and using the meteorological data to transport and diffuse the pollutant uh, they also sometimes include chemical transformation so uh, they typically follow individual air partial from one place to another in different layer of the atmosphere this approach is computationally efficient uh, when treating a limited number of emissions source. so it works best when you have only one or two source of emissions However, uh, it is difficult to properly characterize the interaction of large uh, number of individual sources when non-linear chemistry is involved. And these models have limited usefulness uh, in forecasting secondary pollutants. These are good for only primary pollutants and for uh, tracking the partial over time. One of the example for Lagrangian model is high split chem, which is a very popular model out of NCAR. Now the second type of deterministic air quality models are Eulerian, Eulerian models. Um, the typical Eulerian air quality model is bounded on the bottom by ground and on top at the specified height and some distance on all four side depending on the size of meteorological modeling domain and the area of interest the volume of modeling domain is divided into grid cell these each uh, Eulerian model use a grid of cells which is vertical and horizontal uh, where chemical transformation equations are solved in each cell and pollutants are exchanged between cells so uh, all the uh, atmospheric processes equations are solved for each grid cell uh, whereas uh, in Lagrangian method you are tracking the partial uh, from one place to another place uh, using the metrology um, whereas here you are solving the processes equation or the concentration equation in each grid cell this model can produce three-dimensional concentration field for several pollutants uh, but require significant uh, computational power. So typically uh, the smaller grid uh, represent higher spatial resolution of the model uh, which means you need more computational powers uh, and often leads to higher accuracy. Some of the example of uh, Illyrian model which you might be familiar are CMAG, WARFCAM, uh, GIOS, ECMWF. These are all uh, regional or global models which falls into this category. Now what are the strength of these uh, 3D air quality models uh, or the one which we just talked about uh, uh, physical models or deterministic model, right? So 3D air quality models are phenomenological based, means they 
simulating the physics and chemical process that results in um, formation of particles and destruction of air pollutants. Um, it can actually forecast for larger area irrespective of the ground measurement. So some of the method which we saw earlier depends on the ability of the ground measurement but these models uh, have no impact of ground measurement except we use the ground measurement for either uh, assimilating them into the model or validating the model. The spatial and temporal pattern can be analyzed uh, by mapping the outputs such as one you are seeing here from the GEOS model uh, which is actually mapping the forecast of uh, uh, PM 2.5 uh, during a fire events or a smoke transport uh, over North America uh, during the recent fires. Uh, these models are more suitable uh, for operational regional and global air quality forecasting and alerting public uh, in parallel to the weather forecasting. They can also be used to assess the importance of local emissions, sources and long range transport. Some of the limitations of these models uh, includes uh, the air quality forecasting accuracies depends on the ability of meteorological models to forecast condition with sufficient accuracy. So as we discussed earlier these models are system of model which include meteorological model, emission model and air quality model. So their accuracies are also affected by capabilities of each individual component. Uh, similarly, uh, out of date or coarser resolution, uncertain emission inventories can also lead to be a source of uncertainty in air quality forecast. The special scale of model forecast uh, also becomes important when you are comparing and assessing the forecast using the ground observation. So, if your resolution is very coarse, um, it will be very difficult to compare with the ground measurement because it represents area averaged versus a point location. So it will become challenging to assess the actual accuracy of model forecast. Uh, definitely it requires expertise uh, in both development and running the model for operational air quality forecasting and uh, as a result it involve handling large amount of data sets uh, both uh, as input and output. So we need to understand uh, we so far we looked like various methods to uh, forecast air quality uh, which include very simple criteria or persistent type methods uh, regression including some machine learning methods and then uh, physical methods uh, such as uh, uh, WARF or CMEC type modeling. So depending on the forecasting need uh, different methods can be used. So it is very very critical that we understand the forecasting needs. So we, we probably ask several questions when we ask about the needs who will be uh, who will be your end user for the forecast or who will eventually use this forecast. Uh, what should be the length and frequency of these forecast be? Uh, when the forecast should be initiated? When should be it be beginning of the day, middle of the day, multiple times of the day? Uh, and how frequently you want to revise the forecast? I mean, we can initiate forecast today and forecast for next five days should we wait for another five days to initiate another forecast or should we revise that after six hours when we have more knowledge about the state of atmosphere or should we revise every day typically um, uh, depending on the which model different models uh, revise their forecast every six hours 12 hours or uh, 24 hours and then the accuracy requirement or the level of tolerance uh, so we need to know whether you need to forecast the air quality index or air quality categories or you need to forecast the concentration with certain uh, level of accuracies. Uh, so all these uh, forecasting needs must be understood before we choose 
what kind of model or method we want to use to forecast air quality. Now, how do we assess uh, the forecasting uh, accuracies or the assessing the forecast itself? Uh, so there are many different ways, uh, many statistical methods uh, or the parameters which can be calculated to assess. Uh, one of them is definitely accuracies, which is a mean uh, closeness between the forecast and the observed value. So let's say you made a forecast today, the tomorrow's PM 2.5 will be 50 microgram per cubic meter, 24 hour average. Now tomorrow, when tomorrow day passes, you will have an observed value from the ground as well. So if you compare those two, so the 50 microgram per cubic meter will be your forecast and let's say you observed 45 microgram per cubic meter instead of 50 tomorrow. So the difference between the two and the number of points uh, uh, you can do this over time and calculate the average accuracy of your observation. You can calculate for every day, you can calculate for over a time series so that n is the number of, it can be number of grades, it can be number of ground station, it can be number of time stamp the another quantity uh, and as you can see we have we are trying to take the absolute value here so it basically gives you the accuracy uh, absolute accuracy uh, another term is the bias uh, it indicates whether your uh, bias is very similar to your accuracy but it is not absolute so it uh, and the negative value of bias uh, typically demonstrate that your uh, forecast was underestimated and the positive value of bias will show that it is overestimated. Similarly, correlation is an important quantity typically calculated. Um, here is an example. It basically shows the relationship between observed and forecast values. Sometimes uh, there may not be high accuracy, but the forecast is highly correlated to the observed value. So just to give you an example here, there are four different uh, uh, plot on axis you have observed value, on y axis you have a forecasted values and in first case the correlation is excellent almost close to one to one line, right? So all the points. So it means observed value perfectly matches with the forecast values. In, in case B, you actually have a negative correlation means as your for observed value increasing, uh, your forecast values are decreasing. So it means this is completely, forecast is giving you completely opposite results, uh, although they are correlated up to some extent, but they are in different direction. Um, C has a uh, more realistic view of typically what it looks like. You have a high degree of correlation, but there is a scattered on both sides of the one-to-one -one line. And then D is, uh, basically showing um, a really bad correlation between observed and forecasted value. Now, when you're trying to forecast um, categories uh, or air quality index, uh, which is like good, moderate, then uh, these numerical calculations, um, uh, uh, instead of numerical calculation, we rely on more on uh, accuracy is something called we, we call it confusion matrix where you actually uh, compare each category how they are performing against the observed category so for example in this on uh, vertical line you have observed on um, horizontal line you have forecast so you take say you will say okay uh, there were total k amount of uh, observed uh, uh, number of days uh, good quality was observed and then out of those k how many were observed as good moderate unhealthy or uh, uh, unhealthy for sensitive group in the forecasted so you divide that so let's assume you have 20 forecasted 20 observed value as a good out of those 20 observed value forecasted says 15 were forecasted were also able to uh, forecast them as good 15 times remaining five there were three in the moderate categories there were two 
in this unhealthy to sensitive group and one in unhealthy. So you can say that out of 20, uh, uh, 15, which is about 75% uh, forecasting model was able to predict correct air quality uh, category and then the remaining 25% it was either uh, moderate or other specific. So similarly, you can calculate this confusion matrix for each of the forecasted category and we will look that into a little bit more while we do the exercise. Now one thing which we have not talked so far are role of satellite data in uh, this entire air quality forecasting. How satellite data play a role uh, in entire air quality forecasting exercise. So uh, satellite data have been uh, used in air quality modeling uh, for many different uh, perspective or applications. One of the use of satellite data are emission estimates and currently uh, biomass burning emissions, dust emissions, volcanic emission and certain anthropogenic emissions are actually calculated based on the satellite observation or satellite measurements of these different components and once they are uh, the advantage of using satellite data is that uh, they are globally available and uh, up to some extent very high spatial resolution and uh, you can actually uh, uh, update them into more with more real-time data sets. Satellite data are also used to uh, uh, provide the boundary conditions. So for example, you're running uh, a air quality model over US, uh, you want to know what is coming out within the US from outside the US boundary. So you can use for that satellite data as a boundary condition which can feed to the model and that will help you understand uh, how that thing will transport within the US. Data simulation is most common another way where satellite data are heavily used and we will learn about uh, this data simulation aspect how it has been used in NASA's model and uh, in CAMS model uh, for making uh, air quality forecasting more and more accurate. And then of course uh, since uh, models on run on a certain specific special grids uh, you need to have a uh, high density of ground measurements or special distribution of pollutants to compare or validate uh, models. So satellite data have been heavily used to actually uh, assess the spatial and temporal patterns of pollutant which are either forecasted or simulated by the models uh, um, and it has been done by many many different agencies all around the world. Uh, here are some of the examples. Uh, this is taken from one of our previous uh, webinar series, which you can find the link on our set website. Uh, but this gives you some of the example of biomass burning fire emission database, which were created using uh, one form or another form of satellite observation. And there are a number of them uh, are available. They have varying spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, and each of that uh, reference are given for more details. And now finally, I just like to give you a couple of example of the uh, models, regional models, which have been very popular in the uh, air quality community and have been used by many, many people all around the world. And one of them is called Community Multiscale Air Quality Modeling System. In other words, CMAC, it is a in, uh, open source Eulerian model uh, by developed by US EPA um, used by wide range of researchers all around the world including agencies such as EPA, National Weather Service, CDC. Um, CMAC uses coupled mathematical representation of actual and physical process, chemical and uh, physical process to simulate air quality. So it's the same as Eulerian model properties which we discussed again. Originally, like I said, developed by CMA, uh, EPA, but it's a open source, so larger community contributed in development of this model. Uh, here is the website. You can find all the details. Uh, you can download this model 
and install locally there are database associated with the model uh, which have been run over the time which also can be downloaded from this website and uh, it, it can give you a really good idea how the model works uh, and uh, very good uh, resource for people for students and new uh, professionals who wants to learn how a an air quality model can be run or modified another popular model is uh, weather research and forecasting that is wharf model uh, coupled with the chemistry so it calls wharf chem uh, it's a NOAA development led by NOAA but larger community con contribute uh, to the model development significantly uh, it can also be used for regional scale air quality field campaign analysis uh, or the interaction between clouds and chemistry and many things. so this is just an example showing the smoke forecast uh, using this model um, in the US and you can get some more details uh, and forecast from the link provided below. and finally uh, just want to uh, highlight that a uh, lot of the material presented in this uh, today's session was actually taken from this uh, guideline by developing an air quality uh, and uh, a forecasting program from EPA this is uh, an old document EPA has put together and I will highly recommend anybody who likes to learn about basics of air quality forecasting to uh, go through that in addition uh, several books uh, uh, which people have um, uh, which I have referred throughout the presentation uh, including Seinfeld and Pandis, Ballas and Hobbes um, they really provides more uh, in-depth uh, on the meteorological modeling as well as atmospheric chemistry modeling. Okay, so since we have gone through the presentation and we reviewed uh, some of the meteorological uh, factors which can affect the air quality and those are required to understand uh, or to make air quality forecast and then we also reviewed some of the traditional uh, methods which people uh, have been using uh, to produce air quality forecast and a lot of those methods um, which are such as the cart or regressions or climatology or criteria based method they have been used extensively uh, more uh, on an individual city like levels or local levels where they have to produce forecast just for one location one point location um, whereas the deterministic air quality models uh, which includes WARF, CMAC uh, and then the global model like GEOS or ECMWF they they are more grid based model which they can produce the forecast uh, on a given domain or region or globally with certain spatial and temporal resolution uh, some of them also have a vertical resolution so so what i'm going to talk now uh, is we'll go through an exercise there is a file to download uh, if you click on the today's material there is an excel click on the handout and you will find a Gutta session one exe.xls. This is a basically a Excel spreadsheet with some of the data pre populated, and we'll go through some of the exercise or calculating some of the statistical parameter on how to assess uh, the air quality forecast uh, or how to quantify the accuracies or uncertainties or the pattern in these forecast so i'll give a minute for people to download if you don't have if you want to walk through with me on the exercise uh, these some of the things which i'm going to talk are very very simple so you may already be aware of those and some of them may not be but i think this is a good exercise uh, before we get into more details analysis uh, of this uh, this type of analysis and in part two and then the part three so let's take 
one minute time everybody is ready then i'll start uh, on the exercise so you should be able to open this on your computer if you don't have uh, microsoft excel it should be be able to open in mac or google documents or any of that i just want to uh, mention that the excel file is in the handout section here in go to webinar that will download for you. If you're having trouble downloading it from the web page itself, the training web page, I found that if you right click and then click save as, you'll be able to download it. So right click and click save as. Alternatively, you can download it straight through GoToWebinar on this on your browser tab where you're watching this right now. So just go to the handout section, open it up, you'll see the part one AQ forecasting PDF, and you'll also find Gupta session one EXE, and that can be downloaded through GoToWebinar. Okay, everyone has this file now? So let's begin. Um, sorry, I won't be able to help uh, individuals uh, because we have about four or five hundred people uh, so I'll try to go slow so when you open this uh, Excel spreadsheet you will see on the bottom left there are two sheets one is called data AQI uh, I will not open that for now uh, that is for your reference uh, and later on and the second one is called data so the data has uh, some pre-populated data I created. This is just from random uh, one of the model which we often use. Okay, so this uh, this is a just sample data. Uh, this uh, this is the whole idea of this data set is to give you an example how we can do certain analysis. So it does have a the first column is a station index. You can consider them as a station ID or station name or whatever you can call them. Uh, but basically different number represent they are coming from different ground monitor stations. So these can be basically uh, your air quality monitoring station. This second column is called initialization date. This is the date when the model is initialized. So remember when we were talking about the forecasting especially the uh, physical models they are initialized at certain time right they will uh, start their forecast at 0z or 12z or 18z and with certain frequency this particular model in this case was initialized on february 22 20 uh, year 2020 uh, at 7 a.m uh, time and this one the next column C is called PM 2.5 measured. This is a measured PM 2.5 quantity, um, which is from those ground station. Uh, this is the time at the of the measurement. So you can see this is measured at uh, uh, on the same date, but on different time for, uh, uh, and as the stations changes, you will see the time and date might be changing so this is not very relevant here for this particular exercise but i just want to make sure you understand what these data points are pm 2.5 forecast uh, this is the forecasted value by the model so remember now and uh, these are initialized or forecasted by model at that particular time so this is initialization time it is going to be same throughout the data sets because the model is just forecasted one time and it forecasted for several uh, hours in the future. So you will see that it is forecasted for eight, 17, some station 23 hours. So for the entire day, depending on the station, the time might change. And then the forecast time. So this is the time for which this forecast is valid. So although it was initialized at 7 a.m., but this forecast is valid for 1730. Um, p.m. or 5.30 p.m. and this is the value. Now one thing you will notice between the p.m. 2.5 which is measured and p.m. 2.5 which is forecast is that p.m. 2.5 measured is only um, whole number, 
right? There's no decimal here. And this is, uh, think about why uh, this is a whole number versus PM 2.5 is forecasted as a uh, decimal value. So just think about, we'll get back to you uh, on that little bit later. Uh, okay, now we want to see how good the, typically you don't get the data uh, in the same file from measured and the forecasted values. So uh, before doing this exercise, one of the thing you will have to do is that you will have to, we call it spatial temporal collocation, means we want to match the model at the ground station location using their latitude and longitude so that you will have to do independently. And then the temporal collocation means we have to match the time of the ground measurement which is this here versus the time of the forecasted, not the initialization time, but the time of the forecasted when the forecast is valid. Now you will see there is a difference. The, the ground stations are making measurement at, at whole hours, right? 8, 17, 14, 13 minutes, every hours type of measurements. Whereas the forecasted values are uh, at Typically, they, for this particular model, there are three hour intervals, but the time you will notice that it's 8.30, 17.30, so it's 30 minute difference between ground measurement and the forecast. So this is uh, not, since the ground measurements are not available at sub hourly scales, so unfortunately we cannot do much about this to make both synchronous, but we are assuming that this, forecast is valid for 23 hours also and then that's how we will compare them. So now you will notice that they are uh, kind of temporarily collocated as much as we can do. Okay. Now the first thing uh, if we go back to our presentation we look that we calculated the different uh, accuracies right and to calculate the accuracies we basically calculated uh, what is forecasted minus observed for each value. So to do that, uh, this is my forecasted values and this is my observed values, right? So I calculate this uh, using simple formula. If I drag this all the way down, then it will calculate that value for entire column. Similarly, uh, to calculate, um, so to calculate the bias, we need this. To calculate the accuracy, we need absolute value of this difference. So we'll just take absolute value, sorry. We'll just take uh, absolute value of forecasted minus observation. And basically you don't have to do much. You just take absolute value of this. Again, you drag it all the way down and then Calculate. Now, if you look the formula, then the mean bias is nothing but the mean of this value. So you just calculate average, arithmetic average um, of this column, which is G, and the row number is start from G2 to G176. Once you do that, you will be able to calculate. You can copy this and paste it to the next column. It will calculate the same quantity for this. So this is nothing but your mean bias. That is what we uh, mean bias. And the, since the accuracy is nothing but an absolute value of uh, the difference between forecast and observed, uh, that is your accuracy. So that is in unit of microgram per cubic meter mean bias close to negative it's first of all it's negative it means overall the model is underestimating okay that's what it is saying overall mean on a mean sense and the accuracy is about four uh, microgram per cubic meter so that is you can say in other words the mean difference absolute mean difference between uh, observation and forecast is about four microgram per cubic meter. You can calculate other parameter as well, uh, but these are the very simple two parameter which you can easily calculate. Now let's look, uh, try to do a scatter plot. So to do a scatter plot, we'll select column C, 
always make sure that you plot the measured value on the x-axis so you select that c and e and then click on the insert and under the insert there is a scatter plot now i'm going to move this scatter plot to a separate sheet so that we can actually keep it there and analyze in more better way okay i'm going to also change all the font size so that everybody can see them uh, okay this is odd it's not letting me change it okay good here now you can see this is observed value on x-axis uh, if you want you can um, you can go to the chart design and you can provide the titles primary horizontal is your observed pm 2.5 and then your primary secondary axis is um, your forecasted values now just looking this chart um, you can see that they are really very well correlated and that kind of supports the numbers which we calculated for the mean bias and accuracies now i can do a quickly uh, 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 plot a regression line or a call trend line and there are many different options i'm just going to choose the linear one and then display the equation on the chart and display the r square value also so you can see this linear equation linear line is plotted here the regression coefficient has uh, 0.94 which is less than one which suggests overall underestimation of the in, in terms of the mean the r square is 0 0.87 which basically tells us that forecasts are able to uh, explain about 87 percent variability in the uh, observed data so it may not be 100 percent but this looks very very good uh, for a given forecast again you may not see this all the time you may see poor correlation but that's uh, depending on which model you are using and where you are using it okay so this is one way to look for the um, to understand the performance of the model and now let's also look another quantitative way in which we can actually plot the data as a time series now when you are plotting the da data as a time series remember uh, these data represent for different uh, station so you will have to plot them individually for different stations so to to make it easier what we are going to do is we'll just select all the data and filter them once the data are filtered um, you select the date column and we also select the forecast column and then go to insert and under the chart we'll select this particular options and then i'm going to move this chart to a different call it time series and let me see if i can hold on change the chart type Okay, so the axis have changed here so select the data that's the best way to go and then the first one is observed and x value should be go to the data should be the date so i'll just select this date column all the way down and then the value should be y value should be 
the PN 2.5 for that particular column. Now I'm going to add another time series which is forecasted. Again, your X should be the same date. And the Y is going to be a forecasted value, which is this one. And then click OK. And now you'll see a really messy plot. And this is happening because we have selected all the station together. So we can filter it now since we applied the filter. We'll go to the filter, click on that arrow and then basically select any station we want to display. So I selected the station 10. We have about four values for that. And if you go to the time series, it shows nicely the value on those four. On X axis, you have the date and time. And on Y axis is the PM 2.5. Again, red is forecasted, observed. So you can see that uh, easily we can change this to any station we want. Instead of 10, you can go to 8, and the time series will change accordingly. And both are actually model and observed value are tracking the pollution in very nice way. So this is how we do the quantitative uh, evaluation quickly. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you can also do special and special analysis where you can actually go a little bit more into uh, mapping the data on a map, correlation, bias. You can also compare this with the satellite data to look for the spatial pattern uh, to assess uh, how the spatial patterns from forecast are matching with the satellite observed values of that same quantity. Now, quickly, let me go to this data AQI to actually demonstrate another important aspect, uh, which is called categorical uh, or the classification uh, type of assessment, right? So one is when we were trying to look at the assessing the air quality forecast, one is the concentration itself, which is what we looked so far using the time series scatter plot or accuracy calculation. The second one is, uh, categorical uh, how each air quality is forecasted correctly uh, category is forecasted correctly by the model so as we know uh, based on the range of pm 2.5 there are good categories which is represented by green color there is a moderate which is represented by yellow orange unhealthy for sensitive group and then the red and other colors comes into pictures as the mass concentrations increases and these air quality categories can be calculated for one pollutant concentration or multiple together there are different formulas to do the multiple concentration as well um, also typically these categories are calculated for 24 hour mean average values but you can also do for individual hourly data as well so that is what we did so what i did is the first thing which i don't have time to do it here for everyone but what you can do is you can calculate based on the value of PM 2.5, you can go to here, filter, and then say uh, greater than, I know greater than 55 to 150 is the red color. So I'll select this, uh, then all the, all the data which are in that range will be selected and represented here. So I can color them all, select everything and color them and select and red. So this is going to be red. Similarly, I did this for every, all the categories. And I can display them here. So now you can see this is yellow means um, moderate, unhealthy for sensitive group, unhealthy. Uh, there are only three categories in this data sets. And these same thing, you re repeat the step for the forecasting. Now, how, we, how do we assess the, accuracies of this air quality one is you can just look one to one and see where they are matching where they are not mismatching here they are matching here they are matching here they are not matching mismatching so how do we calculate uh, the accuracies for this kind of classic fire 
So we uh, to do that, we calculate something called confusion matrix, and the confusion matrix is uh, nothing but a accuracy assessment table where you actually calculate or uh, uh, count the number of categories in each uh, bin. So you have yellow, this is for forecasted, and then you have same three categories, yellow, orange, and red from the observed. So on the x-axis is forecasted, on the y-axis is observed values. Now I calculated using uh, using this table that there are total 45 forecasted orange values, uh, yellow values out of which, uh, sorry, there are 45 total observed yellow values out of that 41s were correctly forecasted by um, by forecasting model out of 45 four of them actually forecasted orange instead of yellow and none was forecasted as yellow uh, red and you can see that easily by selecting the only uh, values which are uh, less than 35.5 micron so these are the all the yellow categories now you can see all the 45s are displayed here and there are one two three and four of them are came into the orange. so i calculated that in the same manner i calculated for orange i calculated for red and you will notice that when you total them the total will be 175 either in vertical axis or on the horizontal axis so this is how you calculate the confusion matrix now you can calculate the percentage time when yellow categories is correctly forecasted so you just basically divide this uh, number with the total number when it was forecast so 41 divided by 45 multiply 100 so 91 percent time model was correctly able to forecast the yellow categories 73 percent time the model was correctly able to forecast orange categories and 65 percent times model was correctly able to forecast the red categories so you can see that as the concentration is increasing your accuracy of the model is decreasing you can also calculate the overall accuracies including for all the classes for that what you do is basically add these numbers which are correctly forecasted so 41 plus 72 in orange plus 21 in the red categories and once you do that you divide that by total number of categories 175 so you will see and then multiply by 100 that 76 percent your model is accurately able to forecast certain air quality category whereas the 23 percent 25 percent or 23 uh, percent is it is uh, misclassified so you can calculate the misclassification by just um, subtracting this number 100 100 minus this number and you will get this same number as this this is also calculated using misclassified numbers so you add all the numbers which are misclassified 4 plus 0 plus 20 plus 6 plus 11 plus 0 and then you will get the same number so this is called error rate or misclassification uh, accuracy misclassification uh, rate so you can calculate these uh, accuracies and confusion matrix to assess the quality of the forecast further so i'll just leave it up to here i mean there are more ways to do more sophisticated uh, analysis on this but these are the simplest one which can actually help you understand the uh, the quality of forecast in your region in your uh, study region or uh, location where you live the next session uh, we will um, talk about nasa's geos model and how to access that data my colleague dr melanie fallet cook uh, will lead this session and uh, with that thank you everyone for attending and i'll close it here and then we'll go to the question answer next
so if you have not typed your question you can type in the question section and uh, brock uh, will be able to put that question here in the document and you should be seeing uh, a google doc uh, which we will actually post later on the website uh, but that's where we are going to take the question and address them one by one the first question is where can we download data for average daily values of aqi in popular cities is it available for india in every country so one of the website which does provide uh, global data sets on air quality um, including india uh, is called openaq.org it's a, a non-profit uh, organization which actually collect the data from all the regulatory grade monitors which are available in public domain and provide in nice format and that can be downloaded from there the second question is land cover also a factor that contribute to air quality specifically if surface cover is a sink or absorbs or pollutants uh, uh, yes uh, land cover land use and topography all can directly or indirectly affect the air quality in many different ways they can also be source of uh, emissions uh, they can also be uh, the pollution can also be deposited on them depending on their own property um, so if there is a high topography or much more variability of topography that will affect how the pollution actually settled on the ground uh, but they are more affect, um, likely going to affect the emission than the removal process itself. Okay, so the next question, would it be correct to say that the effect of meteorological factors on PM concentration cannot be inferred from one country to another? Okay. I'm not sure if I understand the question completely correctly, but uh, meteorological conditions more or less affect pollution in the same way, uh, but can vary uh, by environmental factors such as emission source, topography, land use, and other factors, and that those can vary from one country to another country. Uh, so I, I would say yes. The answer is yes and no, uh, depending on how you want to, how much detail you want to infer. Okay, is the persistent method is based on transitional probability? I'm not familiar with this transitional probability theory, but the persistent method is based on the idea that the best predictor of tomorrow weather is the weather today so basically uh, the word persistence here means that if things are persistent from day to day if 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 weather is going to be persistent as tomorrow as it was today then i can forecast it up to some extent what will happen to tomorrow based on what is happening today and same applies to air quality Okay, question five. If low pressure means good air quality, then if a cyclone hits and low pressure is formed, can this create good air quality? Yeah, so it is an interesting question. Uh, under cyclonic conditions, uh, definitely uh, there are many things which happens, uh, not just the low pressure, but rain winds, which really significantly impact the pollutions. Uh, most often is wash out the pollution, um, but it can also circulate in one, in one smaller region. Uh, so depending on what's happening there, it can have different effect. Uh, there are actually more interesting research uh, people are conducting on how the pollution actually impact the formation of the cyclones and hurricane uh, over Atlantic Ocean or in other, in other Indian Ocean and other parts of the so those are more interesting uh, uh, research question i'm not expert of that so i think i'll just leave my answer at that point okay 
Okay, next question. Is there any relationship between chemical elements which are considered as pollutant with other natural pollutants from the emissions cloud? Uh, yes, all kind of particles and gases does interact uh, with each other in the atmosphere. Uh, and the interaction will depend on their chemical properties, optical properties, and environmental conditions. So this happens irrespective of their uh, natural or anthropogenic uh, origin. And most particles which are actually either, whether they emit from anthropogenic activities or natural activities are considered pollutants. Uh, some of them are called criteria pollutants, which are known to be more harmful to human health. And those are the monitored by the environmental agencies. But there are other many types of components uh, in the atmosphere or pollutant in the atmosphere, which may not be regularly monitored, uh, but they are still pollutant. Okay, question seven. In using satellite data for research, is it acceptable to use purely remote sensing data without an in-situ grouping? How can we prove the accuracy of these satellite data? Yeah, this is a very good question. So it really depends on the purpose and application of what research <coughs> you are doing. Most often, uh, you need some kind of ground observations to ground truth satellite data or to assess the accuracies of the satellite data. But some of the satellite data uh, probably may not have similar measurement from the ground and which may not be uh, that may not be able to assess their accuracy using the ground measurement alone. Uh, Sometimes you can also inter compare the satellites uh, and that will give you a consistency check. Uh, on how one satellite is performing against, uh, against another. Uh, the model to satellite comparisons is another way to get some uh, insight on the accuracies and uh, the performance of the satellite data. Question number eight, can satellite data for air quality forecasting be visualized in Google Earth Engine through coding? So I'm not sure if Google Earth Engine has any uh, any air quality forecasted data as of now. There are efforts ongoing where uh, NASA and other agencies are trying to uh, feed the air quality data uh, to Google Earth Engine for everyone to access and uh, visualize and do other kind of analysis within the engine. Uh, but as of now, uh, I don't think there are any forecasting data available. But you can actually take the forecasting data yourself and upload to the Google Earth Engine, and then you can visualize or analyze the data in the uh, in that manner. Question nine, can I access CMake, WARF and other models interactively to download data? Where can I download model data for a city or town? Uh, CMake website and the link is provided in the presentation does have some uh, data generated uh, which can be downloaded, uh, downloadable and is available to the public. Uh, some of the WARF data are also available to download and in session two and session three, we will actually learn how to download the global forecast data uh, from NASA's GIOS and uh, CAMS ECMWF model um, during session two and three. So stay tuned for downloading the data in session two and three. Okay. Question 10, uh, how about the capability of satellite data of air pollution in local scale analysis? Okay, I'm not, the question is pretty open end, but satellite data have been heavily used to actually address many local air quality uh, uh, 
scenarios, for, for example, um, looking the air quality uh, among different neighborhood scales using satellite data, but these are very limited analysis uh, and required in-depth uh, understanding of the satellite data as well as uh, uh, skills to, to modify the data in different ways. Um, there are the current satellite data which are available from the satellites are of uh, about one kilometer spatial resolution scale. Uh, there are not many data which are available lower than that. In terms of the temporal scales, we have uh, hourly data available now, at least for the US um, and uh, some part of Asia as well. But uh, we, we are improving actually both on a spatial and temporal scales uh, in terms of uh, getting information from different satellites. Okay, the question number 11. While the high resolution one kilometer observation like MCD 19A2 MIOC for AOD is retrieved at time of the satellite pass orbit wise data in the model like warfarin be output in a fixed time space okay how should we correlate these two variables if we're interested in air pollution modeling at urban scale yes so this is a very good question and it brings back to our spatial temporal co-location aspect so one is uh, you will have to uh, there are two ways you can do is one is you can choose the nearest uh, hour of the satellite overpass time to the model time to match the uh, temporal window uh, unfortunately not much can be done in that you will have to assume that uh, nearest model run is uh, valid in most cases it is valid but uh, if there are uh, uh, there are air quality events which going on which are highly variable in time then this assumption may not be valid but most often it can be uh, used uh, on a larger uh, regional scale uh, on a local or urban scale you will also have to be uh, make sure that your uh, spatial skills match when you're comparing model data with the satellite data so if your wharf uh, spatial scale is 12 kilometer then it's better to use similar resolution satellite data which is like 10 kilometer or if you still want to use one kilometer then you have to average the one enough number of one pixel one kilometer pixels to fill the grid of your 10 12 kilometer uh, wharf cam grids so it is it is critical to actually uh, to match the spatial resolution and temporal uh, resolution before you make any comparison. Okay, uh, the next question. In the data example from the exercise, uh, does it matter if the time is local or all for a specific type zones or the stations in the same or time different zone yes very good question that definitely matters uh, so whenever we are making comparison either between the satellites or um, with the model and uh, ground station uh, it is very very critical to ensure that both uh, model and grounds represent same time zone so they can be local or they can be NUTC it does not matter at that as long as both are in same time zone and co-located question 13 I have a one kilometer grid PM concentration derived from a dispersion modeling, I want to correlate with measurement from monitoring station. Should I do the correlation with corresponding grid concentration or do I first do creating interpolation of grid concentration before correlating with the ground measurement? Okay. Um, 
so i think um, many different ways you can do this analysis uh, the simplest way will be to actually locate your one kilometer closest one kilometer grid in your dispersion model uh, corresponding which is the nearest to the ground station and then use that uh, uh, grid's value to compare with the ground measurements so that will be the uh, most uh, closest measurement from uh, the most closest model value corresponding uh, to the ground station and then make sure that times are also matching before you make the comparison i don't think you need to do any kind of krigging or any interpolation to the model because that's already a very high resolution you can also do a box averaging sometimes that also helps uh, so depending on your model temporal resolution you can draw a box of uh, five by five kilometer around the ground station and average all the values from the dispersion model and then you can compare with the value from the ground monitoring station so you can depending on what you are trying to achieve uh, you can compare that in different ways okay question 14 uh, exactly how to carry out this uh, temporal matching say if the ground measurement is taken at 945 hours is it mandatory to have a satellite pass or model forecast for the same time only or predict value plus minus 30 minute or any such temporal window from ground measurement time can be considered for variation yes so you will always have to uh, it is very very hard to actually get exact same timing from both satellite and the ground measurement uh, most often we do use a temporal window of averaging which can be plus minus 30 minute depending on resolution of the ground data uh, it can be plus minus 30 minute it can be plus minus one hour uh, depending on how frequent measurements are available from which value of correlation can be considered we have a good forecasted value uh, this is a difficult question uh, i doubt there is any um, uh, depending on so the correlation importance of significance of correlation highly depends on how many number of data points you have uh, you can have very high correlation uh, and it may not be very significant if you have only three data points and your correlation is 0.9 uh, it may not have a very high significance because your number of data points are not that enough to produce a significant correlation uh, but if you have a correlation of 0.5 or 0.6 and your number of data points are like thousands of data points then it does shows some skills uh, in forecasting so Correlation is a relative term. Uh, I would recommend you read about it some. It does have a uh, relationship with the number of data points and it also has, uh, there are other uh, parameters which you can calculate along with the correlation, something called p-value, uh, which provide the significance of your statistical parameters. How do you deal with the missing data? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure relation to what, but missing data are missing data. We, uh, we can't do anything about them. Uh, some people uh, have uh, ways to fill in those missing data, uh, but I personally don't recommend doing that. Uh, specifically if you have a few months of data missing there's no not much you can do it question 17 ozone is considered as pollutant in the lower atmosphere but not when it is present in the stratosphere is there any mechanism by which ozone can move to stratosphere from the troposphere or deposit to ground like in case of aerosols so there are 
mechanism or processes in the atmosphere where air actually uh, exchange uh, between upper troposphere and stratosphere um, and in that exchange sometime ozone can transport downwind or the air can transport uh, to the stratosphere i'm not very uh, sure about those exact process how they works uh, i'm not uh, i really don't work that much on ozone field so i'm not sure uh, but there are processes which happen i am not familiar with any mechanism through which ozone actually deposit the ground uh, typically most of the ozone form and destroyed in the atmosphere through the chemical uh, reactions pawan yes you want to add something yeah yeah dry deposition of ozone is um definitely an important sink of ozone especially okay. when ozone deposits through plant stomata and can damage the health of the plant it's through this mechanism that ozone pollution can be detrimental to ecosystems great thanks thanks melanie sure okay uh... Question 18, how can we apply global model to forecast for local area where ground monitoring extensions are very few? Uh, I will leave that question. I think we are going to talk a lot about global models um, in session two and session three. And I think that will clear up some of these doubts. How can we do uncertainty analysis while forecasting emissions? Uh, we are in this webinar series we are not doing forecasting of the emission itself uh, so i think there are there are different type of emission models which can be used for the emission forecasting itself and they are based on some other type of scenarios uh, i'm not too much familiar of those um, melanie do you have anything to add on the forecasting of emission itself I'm sorry, I was typing another answer. Are you talking about question 19? Yeah. Do you have anything on the emission forecasting itself? We can do uh, verification about emissions, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure about. We validate emissions inventories themselves um, in the case of things like power plants or cars. You know, there's constant efforts to validate those emissions inventories that are put into the model. And then those pollutants are forecasted around the model. In the case of dynamic emissions, like fire emissions or dust emissions, um, we typically use verifications of those forecasts to evaluate the effectiveness of those parameterizations. Yeah, and I think the another factor comes to play in the forecasting the emissions are based on the uh, policy and decision making which happens or change in regulation for certain things. Um, once we know those kind of things, then the emission forecasting can be done based on uh, change in industry standard or change in fuel type or change in certain things. Uh, some regulations, um, but those are different types of forecasting uh, and that is done uh, by mostly regulatory agencies. Okay. Uh, how does a wildfire affect the air quality of the near region? How long does the pollution persist? Could we build a model to measure and predict that? Yes. Uh, yes, wildfire does affect air quality. Basically, whenever there is a fire, wildfire, it emits a lot of smokes, and the smoke is transported to different parts. Uh, it can transport thousands of kilometers depending on uh, how big the fire is and how much smoke is emitting. Uh, the, the, the transports happens with the weather patterns, so uh, wind direction, wind speed, uh, where in the atmosphere that transport is happening uh, and the smoke can stay in the atmosphere for several uh, days sometimes weeks uh, depending on uh, again where it is uh, in the atmosphere 
uh, and it definitely affects the air quality at the surface. There are uh, most of the air quality model which we use nowadays does use a emissions of a smoke or particles based on the satellite observations, uh, which uh, we are going to talk a little bit about that in the session two and three, uh, how those fire emissions are actually used in the model uh, to predict their quality in different parts. Uh, there are WARF and CMAC and GEOS, all of them have this kind of emission inventories uh, based on the wildfires. Okay, question 21. How do I convert OMI SO2 data from Dobson units to microgram per cubic meter? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, Melanie, do you have exact answer? I remember we looked into that earlier, but I don't remember it. So in order to, so the Dobson unit is a column quantity. Um, for other pollutants, we see a column quantity expressed as, say, molecules per centimeter squared. There's a direct numerical conversion from molecules per centimeter squared to Dobson units. Um, so in order to convert a surface measurement to, that is a surface concentration, say, um, to a column quantity, you need information about the vertical profile of that species, as well as the temperature and pressure profiles. Um, so, nor so you unfortunately probably need additional information. There's not a direct conversion between them without that vertical information. Yeah, I mean, they are basically two different type of measurements. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and they represent different quantity, although they are highly correlated. Uh, so that's another way to make a conversion that you correlate those two and then get some kind of a uh, empirical relationship between those two and then that's how you can probably convert one into another. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, we have probably all the questions responded. Again, thank you everyone. Stay tuned for the next Tuesday, we will have a whole presentation and exercise on NASA's GEOS model uh, and some of the reanalysis, how to access that forecast, how that works. So thanks everyone.